you guys hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I want to talk about this idea of free range learning. And uh, first, I want to mention that uh, for the first time ever, my illustrator is in the audience. He's over here. Wave your hand. There you go. So, uh, he does these fabulous illustrations for my presentations, and uh, you can go tell how good they are afterwards. Um, so, free range learning. Uh, a couple people have asked me that it, you know, if there's a free range learning, does that mean that there's like a factory oriented caged learning as well? And um, you could, you know, make the analogy that uh, the education system we have, being somewhat oriented around a factory industrial model, is something of a caged learning system. But I would prefer to think of it as more of a structured, formal system than caged. That just sounds better to me, since I am actually within the system. Um, but, uh, but we do have, I think, free range learning available now. That's the um, unstructured learning that happens outside of schools and formal training opportunities and companies. And uh, what, I've, what we've built here is kind of a, a house of, of makers and learners. And there are many ways to learn now outside of formal education. And I want to walk you through um, some of the things that you really need to incorporate in order to be a successful free range learner. So we're going to start with this idea that I hear quite a bit, which is that um, you can learn anything from the internet. That there's information freely available. I'm sure you've heard this. You've probably experienced it. There's, there is information freely available on the internet. Um, the internet has basically been replicating all of our non-digital information sources. So we created Wikipedia, which is a copy of encyclopedias, right? We create um, articles and, and magazine articles, newspaper articles in a digital form now. Right? We have, of course, libraries of books. Uh, there's a scanning book project at the University of Michigan, uh, Google Scholar, all sorts of efforts all over the world to scan not only new books, but ancient texts so that they're available to all. Uh, we've even replicated the radio in the digital world. We have podcasts. We have um, audiobooks. We have streaming radio stations that don't even exist in the real world, just on the internet. Right? So we've recreated audio, and of course we've recreated this experience of a, a real in-person um, oral presentation. Right? We record these things, we put them up online, we have movies, we have TV shows, we have talks from conferences, we have discussions. All of this stuff is basically just, all we've been doing so far is mimicking what happens in the real world and doing it online. But the nice thing is that information is all now available for us. So can you learn anything from the internet? Well, certainly we have all the resources now, right? And, and so you, you think to yourself, well, everything that happens inside of education, there's no reason why it can't happen outside of education too. So it certainly seems like you should be able to learn anything from the internet. But <laughs> this is where this thing called optimism bias comes in. And optimism bias is when we kind of overextend our beliefs of what we can actually accomplish. So uh, maybe you've had this experience before where you think to yourself, I'm going to learn how to speak Spanish, let's say, right? I'm going to learn how to speak Spanish. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to sit down every day. I'm going to do some lessons. I'm going to learn how to speak the language. I go out. I buy some software to help me. Um, and then time goes by. And like a year later, you'll find that box of software you purchased and realize you never even installed the software. It was just this, this goal you had, this vision of you knowing Spanish that never came to fruition because there wasn't really a plan in place for how to do that or a support structure for it. So this, this optimism bias can get you if you're not careful. Yes, it seems like we should be able to learn anything from the internet, but you have to put some things in place to do that well. So I want to talk about those things. And um, the internet has certainly become our, our resource for one-time tasks. Working? OK, there we go. Um, so the internet has become our go-to resource for one-time tasks. So what that means is we are now used to this idea that if my bicycle breaks, or my dishwasher breaks, or my sink starts to leak, you know, what do you do? Do you call a plumber or do you go, all right, I'll go to YouTube and I'll look for a leaky sink and I'll find a solution for it and, and, and use it, right? And, and for one-time um, sources, for one-time tasks, the internet is fabulous. 
And it works great because you can watch exactly what you need to do and then you actually carry it out. Um, and, and so we, we have in our minds this idea that if anything can be learned from the internet. But there's a big difference between learning a one-time task and like a whole body of knowledge. Okay? So let's say that instead um, we wanted to learn about the architecture of a computer system. We want to learn all the parts, what they do, the history of those parts, the future of those parts, how they interact with each other. I mean, that's a much larger body of knowledge. And you can't, while you can learn about individual pieces by going out and looking for videos, you won't understand the whole interconnected system by just consuming information like that. There's a lot more to learning that, that we need to do that. So consuming information is not the same thing as understanding and wisdom and knowledge. So there's information, and then when that becomes structured together in an interconnection, in an interconnected way, we truly become more of experts and able to uh, do something useful with our knowledge. So we need to understand how we get from information to those things. And that's what brings us back to this, that there is actually a recipe for free-range learning. And you can't just say, information is free, information is available, I can learn anything from the internet, unless there's more to your plan than that. So, in any good recipe, you start with ingredients, right? So here's our ingredients, um, and ingredients are very important. Uh, it's certainly important in the realm of the internet to find ingredients that are, um, are good resources, that are up-to-date resources, uh, that are vetted resources, see, I'm about to fall off the stage already. But if I was to just hand you the ingredients for making cookies, let's say I gave you flour and sugar and milk and butter and chocolate chips, and I said, make chocolate chip cookies. You think you could do it? Maybe some of you can. If you're a baker, maybe you could pull it off, or you could at least get chocolate chip blocks you know, in front of you. But I think most of us, if we were just handed the ingredients, would not have much luck successfully baking chocolate chip cookies unless we had a set of directions. So we also need a good set of directions along with our ingredients, okay? And um, not only do we need a set of directions, but we need to have some idea what cooking looks like in the field of learning, right? If I gave somebody the ingredients and a set of directions and dropped them in a kitchen and they had never used a kitchen before, they would be in trouble still, okay? So we need to understand um, what cooking of learning looks like. So what I want to start with is, just for kind of a principles here, is this, um, this set of curves, which is called the Ebbinghaus, uh, it's from the Ebbinghaus Research, which was done in 1885, okay, so it's very old stuff. But what it basically says is that when we learn something, if you look up here on the curve, when we learn something for the first time, our memory of that drops off pretty precipitously, unless we encounter it again, at which case the slope becomes a little less, and if we encounter it again, the slope becomes a little less, until the point where we're basically retaining that information in our memories, in our biological memories. And if we're going to become expert in any body of knowledge, we have to retain some information in our biological memories. Yeah, we can Google everything, but you have to have information in your head to be able to hold a conversation, to be able to put a lot of facts together, to be able to create an action plan, come up with new ideas. So we have to have a plan for getting what we want to learn into our biological memory that at least creates a taxonomy that makes the world google a bowl in that subject, okay? So we also need to have uh, the right tools. And I think that with all the technology we have today, there's no reason we can't build some of the tools we're missing, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, the other thing we need is a significant time investment. It takes a lot of time to learn a subject well. And um, there's this idea that's been in this book, uh, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours to become an expert. And you got to put in 10,000 hours to become an expert. And just to give you a bit of perspective on that, a college degree, from start to finish, takes somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 4,500 hours. But a college degree is not highly specified. It's very general, broad knowledge. So maybe the second half of that degree is highly specified. In which case, at the end of a four-year college degree, you've got one to 3,000 hours in on this 10,000 hours to become an expert. So even with a college degree, you still have to keep learning in the free-range environment to become an expert in your field. Okay, so how do we successfully do this? How do we complete, I like to call them learning challenges, okay? You 
put something in front of yourself, you say, I want to learn this, that's your learning challenge. How do I actually accomplish that? So we're going to go up to the top floor of our little maker house here. I'll just let you look at that for a sec. It's kind of cool. Just a sec, though. So, of course, we have to consume information. There's no way around that. Consume it how you want. Read it, listen to it, watch it, talk about it, um, build stuff. But we have to consume information. Um, that's how we get basics into our head. But, more importantly than consumption is that you have to reflect about what you're learning. And that reflection brings the information back in steps over time so that you retain it in biological memory. Remember the curves? Right, so we have to build in something that, so that allows you to reflect on what you're learning. And there's a lot of ways people do that. The old-fashioned way here would be to keep a journal of some sort, right? And the rule would be not just to keep the journal, but every time you write in the journal, go back and read the previous two pages or five pages or something, because that brings back the information to your head over and over, right? If all you do is write new stuff and never look at the old stuff, that's not going to help you. It'll help a little bit, but not a lot, okay? So you have to have a practice and reflection built into that. Um, something that I've, I've actually done recently, which I found to be very effective in the modern uh, scheme of things, is to tweet what you're learning. Uh, I had to recently write a dissertation, and that takes about 500 to 1,000 hours, by the way. Um, and uh, so what I did was every hour I spent, I sent out a tweet about what I had learned. And that created a community of followers who was interested in what I was learning. It gave me a kind of a track of what I had been learning, links to articles, or things that I had found interesting. It was a good way to um, kind of keep, keep myself honest and see that information over, over and over and over time. Certainly, many of us do something like write a blog um, as a way to learn and connect with other learners in the subject area. Uh, in 2007, I began to learn about math and technology. And I started a blog then and have since written about, I don't know, 600, 700 posts about math and technology. I've never taken a single class, right? But in that, that series of, of blog posts, I became something of an expert in this field, simply by looking at what was out there, reflecting on it, trying it, reporting back on how it went, um, and then, again, connecting with the community with that. Alternatives to blogs, you could do a video log, you could do a podcast. If you're not much into writing, get a little camera and interview people about the subject. Do something to make sure that you are constantly reflecting on the learning that, you, that you've got. Do it with a friend and have a conversation every week that you record for five minutes or something. There's got to be something built in here for this reflection. Um, this is a maker fair, so I think I should probably say at least that uh, you should consider writing a how-to guide as you go. As you're learning something, Write up how you're doing it. If somebody else has already written up how to do it, write it for a different audience. Write it for a group of kids, or a group of seniors, or a different language or something. But in explaining what you're doing to somebody else, you certainly learn it better. And then, uh, last in this category, I think it's important to set aside some dedicated thinking time. Time where you literally do nothing else but think. And we do this so little today, this time when we don't have our phones in our hand, the TV is not on, and it, probably the time you notice it most right now is in the shower. You probably notice that you have brilliant ideas in the shower, that like things occur to you that never occur to you outside the shower. Well, in the shower, all of the devices are taken away. There's this nice white noise in the background that kind of drowns everything else out. And after about five minutes in the shower, your brain starts to relax and the good ideas start to come. Other places I've noticed this, airplanes. You know, if you're cut off from the wireless and the noise, you get the background noise, it can be really a good place to do it too. But you know, certainly you could set a, a space in your house besides the bathroom, because we don't want to waste a lot of water, uh, to do this kind of thing, a meditation room or just you know, taking the dogs for a walk or something. But, Actually setting aside some time to think about the things you're trying to learn, to let your mind wander and make connections on its own. Okay, so that's the top story of our house. Um, we're going to move down to this story right here uh, and talk about uh, cultivating a learning community, which we've already talked about a little bit. I mean, the maker groups are learning communities, hacker spaces, maker spaces, um, maker fairs, and so um, we, we, you want to make sure that if you're trying to learn something new, you create a learning community. Because that learning community will push you to learn even when you forget. So if we go back to the idea of learning Spanish, the reason that those efforts often fail is because there was nobody else who was speaking Spanish to you. Right? You're probably more likely to learn how to speak Spanish if you live with somebody who speaks Spanish to you. 
or you interact on a daily basis with somebody who speaks Spanish with you. So you create a community that pushes you. So, you know, one way to do that is with social networks, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, whatever your, your poison is, create a social network of people who are learning about the things you want to learn about. Because every time you see a post from them, that'll remind you you want to learn about it. Then you'll go read the articles they post, and you'll watch the videos they post, and it will become the network that pushes you to actually do the learning. Uh, another great way to, to develop a learning community is to offer to explain what you're learning to other people. Find a child or a cousin or a, you know, a group of students or um, some friends and offer to, to explain to them the things that you've just learned. There's no better way to learn something than to teach it to somebody else. And now you're, again, creating a community. One thing I should mention here is that new ideas, innovations, actually aren't new at all. They come from kind of a marinade of old ideas mixed with new information. And so you remember I said it's important that you keep reflecting on the old stuff you know. Well, that's because if you don't, you're not likely to have new ideas. It's seeing that, you know, something you thought about three years ago with something you're looking at now that actually creates the innovation. Um, so it, it's really important to go back and look at old things you've written or watched or, um, or explored in the past. And kind of fun, too, actually. This is our flying fun, too, boat, by the way, which we have now been talking about for nine years and haven't built yet. Um, so then, of course, there is, you know, this kind of mundane, you know, in some fields that you're trying to learn, it's important to practice, right? You want to learn how to play an instrument? You're probably not going to learn it by consuming information and reflecting alone. It's probably going to take some practice. Um, and unfortunately, in school, this is the thing everybody hates, because what do we call practice in school? Homework, yeah. And so um, I like to call them now learning challenges instead of homework. It seems like a better phrasing to me. That's what it is challenging your learning at home. Um, learning does need constant attention. If you drop off of what you're trying to learn for a while, you're going to lose it. You have to keep kind of watering it um, to grow. This, I, I, he, uh, the guy who introduced me said I, I do a lot of work with gaming, and I do, and there's this really interesting um, game dynamic called appointment dynamic. An appointment dynamic is how Farmville works. Anyone here played in Farmville at some point? That's willing to admit it? Okay. Um, so appointment dynamic is when uh, you have to log in a set time to accomplish a set task. And doing that rewards you in some way, right? And so what we kind of need in this free-range learning environment is an appointment dynamic that keeps you on task, where you are rewarded for good behaviors, for learning um, what you mean to be learning in a, on a daily basis. So I think we can kind of take advantage of some of that. Another thing you need to have, and I think this is almost the most important thing, uh, if you want to learn in the free range, you have to set goals. And they have to be goals that are not easy to postpone. This is why school actually works so well for so many people. I mean, the majority of us get educated through some kind of school system. And the reason you do things like take tests and write papers uh, is because if we had a goal, very few of us actually will accomplish our tasks without like a, a deadline, right? Now like this presentation was at noon today, so I of course was finishing this presentation when do you think? This, this morning, right? This morning. So I got up at four to finish up the last you know two weeks. But if I wasn't giving the presentation today, would I have done that? No. <laughs> so you have to give yourself goals, goals that you can't postpone. Now when you sign up to run a marathon, they're not going to move the marathon date for you, right? I mean, you've, set up, you've signed up for it, you've paid your money, and it's likely you will train for it because of that. But you've got to do the same thing with learning. So if your goal, like, like last year, for example, I wanted to kind of spend a lot of time thinking about the future of e-learning. So I signed up to give a presentation about the future of e-learning about nine months from that point, right? What did that mean? I read everything having to do with e-learning. I thought about it. I talked to people. I had conversations. I did everything I needed to do to prepare for a talk I was not ready for when I signed up for it. Right? And that's the kind of thing you have to do in a learning environment to keep yourself honest. Because if you don't have the structure of a teacher or a grade or something like that to keep you kind of motivated, you've got to provide that for yourself. Of course, at something like this, this is a good way to do it, right? If you sign up to present something at the Maker Fair, you're probably going to finish it, right? I'm sure there were lots of people up late nights this week finishing off the final touches of their projects. Um, it's a good, 
it, it's also good to seek out first-hand experience when you can find it. It's not always easy. I mean, if you want to learn about nuclear submarines, I'm not sure how much first-hand experience you're going to get, but in some areas it's easier than others. And again, this is where it helps to have that learning community, because maybe you don't have access to a nuclear submarine, but maybe somebody in your learning community does and can help you out with that. And that brings us back to Maker Fairs, right? A great opportunity to meet people and, and connect and try things out firsthand. Okay, so is free range learning possible? Yeah, of course it's possible, okay? But what I want you to be careful of is just because it's free doesn't mean it's going to happen naturally. It's going to require some hard work, okay? Just the same way as going to school requires some hard work. It's not a free ride, okay? Um, we have some tools right now for free range learning, but they're not, they're, they're kind of primitive tools. I mean, like the, the types of things I'm doing, I have to basically be self-motivated to do this myself. Tweeting every hour, writing blog posts, there's nothing that encourages me to do these things. And I have to be the one to organize all of this stuff myself. So, I think we need some more sophisticated tools. And I actually think we have all of the technologies right now to build them. All of the technologies to build them. And I want to just talk about one really briefly. Um, so what will the future bring? I think the first thing that we need and that we can build so easily is to learn this button on everything on the internet. You know, we've got, we've got uh, text, we've got video, we've got audio, we've got games, and we can learn from all of these things, right? So imagine for a second that, you know, you're watching a TED Talk, and there's your Facebook like button and your tweet button, right? Well, why the heck don't we have a learn button? right there next to everything else, right? You press the learn button and that's an indication to your system that you have, there's something in here you want to learn, right? So that learn button would bring you into a platform where it would note, you know, what the URL is, right? So it could bring you back there eventually if you can't remember something. And you would just put in your question and answer, like the thing that you thought was important that you want to learn. It doesn't, we're not talking multiple choice or anything like that, just an open, free response kind of thing. So I might say, if I was watching a TED talk about game dynamics, my question might be, what's an appointment dynamic? And my answer would be, you know, an appointment dynamic is uh, when you have to show up at a set time and accomplish a set task and you get rewarded for it. Right? So that's the thing I want to remember. It's important to me. It might have been a 20 minute talk and each one of us might have gotten something different out of it. That's the thing I got out of it and that's what I want to remember. Right? So I create a question. I might mark, you know, what of my learning categories is this? You know, I might just try to stick to three, I recommend. Um, and so it goes into the system, and then over time, what the system would do is feed the questions back to you in a spaced repetition pattern so that, you remember that learning curve again? So that you re-engage with it over time, right? So you're sitting at the doctor's office, or 10 minutes before your appointment, you pull out your mobile phone, and you're like, okay, I'm going to answer some questions because I'll get rewarded in the system for doing that, right? So I get, a, I get a question, my question comes back to me, what's an appointment dynamic? And then I just think to myself what the answer is, so I go through the answer, and I say, okay, show me the answer. Right? And I look at the answer and I just rate myself. The computer doesn't have to rate me, I can rate me. Right? I can say either I knew it, I didn't know it, or it was something in between. Right? And if I didn't know it or it was something in between, well, it should certainly offer to send me back to whatever it is I want to see. Whatever it is I saw in the first place. Um, if we had such a system, I think that it could become very robust. It could become, um, we could use something called a reputation dynamic to make it so that we all want to be learning and showing off what we're learning. You know, imagine on Facebook, uh, Maria has achieved level four of game dynamics or something like that, so you can show your friends what you've accomplished. But just looking at this purely from an HR standpoint, if I was hiring two employees, or hiring an employee, and I had two candidates, and both candidates looked exactly the same on paper, but one of them was participating in something like this and could show that they were learning on a regular basis, and the other one wasn't, I think I'd rather have the one I knew was learning. Because that means they're engaged in the current community. Just having the degree on paper doesn't do it for me. And I've got degrees that are like 20 years old now, and you won't want me teaching any of those subjects. And meanwhile, I, I know subjects I don't have degrees for. So I think that we need a system that reflects all of this, and there's no reason we can't build it very easily now. Okay, so here's this whole ecosystem we have. And uh, what I want to talk about is the last thing I'm going to talk about is how we can shift our value cosm right now, like how, how all of you can go out today and start helping me to shift our value cosm back towards learning, okay? Um, 
Because I think right now our, our values are very centered around things like entertainment and sports and celebrities. And even education is seen as like a series of tasks, like you check the boxes, right? At the end, you get your paper. When I ask somebody why they're going to school, it's always to get a job, to get a degree, to get a job. It's not to learn. Nobody tells me they're there to learn, which is a little bit sad. And actually, if I ask my students, what have you learned in the last week outside of my class, they can very rarely tell me, and they're in college, so they should really be learning something. So there's something wrong with their value system, that this is not front and center. So how do we shift the value cosmic to focus on learning? I can give you two things to do. Actually, it's really just one thing to do. Are you ready? We can all start today, okay? Um, just change the way we greet people, okay? So right now you might say like, you know, hey, how you doing? I want you to stay and say, you're like, hey, baby, what do you like to learn about? You know, new pickup line, okay? Or uh, what have you been learning lately? You know, you go to a party and you meet somebody and you say like, what do you do for a living? Who cares what you do for a living? Most of us do stuff for a living that is not really our passion. Why aren't we asking questions like, what do you like to learn about instead? We would learn a lot more about people by knowing that, okay? So, so that's it. I think if we all started doing this, if we all started asking learning questions instead of reading questions, we would suddenly start to refocus, starting with our own social circles and moving our way out, that, that learning is the thing that's important. What you're passionate about is the thing that's important not the fact that you work at McDonald's. You can work at McDonald's and be studying quantum mechanics. It's much more interesting that you're studying quantum mechanics. So that's our, our uh, free range learning environment. I think there are many ways we can learn outside of formal education, but it's not a free ride, right? Information is free, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to do these things. If you put some systems in place, it is, but you have to do that extra work. Um, so I just want you to be aware of all these things, and um, I think that that is actually um, it. But that's the reason why I call this a recipe for free range learning. Okay? There is a recipe. It's ingredients, directions, cook time, right? And then, you know, what do you do when you finish cooking something? You hand it to somebody to try, right? That's your final challenge. Okay? So that's that's uh, basically it. So thanks for.